Okay, so if anybody wants if anybody wants to add anything tonight, um, feel free, you know, to say something, or you can text in the in the box. So tonight we're going to talk about um, head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, and the physical exam. So when you do a physical exam on somebody and they come in, um, you're going to do a complete health history. Um, and while you're doing that health history, you're going to take a general assessment of the person and you're looking at their level of consciousness. Um, are they awake? Are they alert? Are they confused? Um, their mood, their affect? Um, are they fidgety? Are they anxious? Are they making eye contact? To build their weight, how they're dressed. Um, if it's an elderly person, are they dressed appropriately? Well, actually not only elderly. Um, but are they dressed appropriately for the season, for the age, for their... Um, for the weather. Uh, for, a phys for a complete physical exam, somebody have a question? For a complete physical exam, you're going to do a head to toe physical. And throughout that exam, you want to keep pertinent points of the patient's health history and their chief complaints foremost in mind. So if somebody's saying to you, you know, I've been really tired lately, I've put on 10 pounds the past five, you know, past month, um, I'm really cold, well, Immediately, you're going to think, well, maybe the thyroid's off. So you're going to focus when you get to that thyroid to look at it to see if it's enlarged, um, to see if there's tenderness there. So you want to keep that foremost in your mind. And then the physical exam, when you start it, it's, you're going to have them sit on the exam if, on the exam table if they can get up there, and you're going to start at the head. Um, so you tell me, what determines if the exam is comprehensive or focused? If it's a first-time visitor, uh, maybe their chief complaint. Okay. What else? Is well, it, is it, versus six is it how yeah. far in depth you go into each exam? Like if their, you know, if their eyes seem to be okay, you wouldn't do, you know, the whole slew of tests on them. Well, you're still going to check certain things. So, chief complaint or routine physical. Time. Way appointment was scheduled, the subjective and objective findings, okay. And their chief complaint. So it's going to be the reason for the visit um, or the extent of their illness. So if you have somebody who's coming brand new to you, um, most likely you're going to do a complete physical. However, with that said, I've had patients who have had an appointment, like on Friday, um, for a complete physical and then show up in the office or call the Tuesday before because all of a sudden they have a sinus infection or something happened. So we end up seeing them before we actually do the physical. So if it's usually, if it's a new person, you're going to do a complete physical on them first. However, somebody that you know who's been a patient might come in into the emergency room because they fell and they hurt their knee or into the office because they fell and hurt their knee um, or they have a sign, think they have a sinus infection or something going on. So you're going to focus it depending on the extent of the illness, and the reason for the visit. Okay? So when you start at the head and neck exams, you inspect. You're going to start at the head, um, and you proceed systematically downward. Um, it's just much easier to do it that way. I have a student who um, last week was doing a physical, and I was getting dizzy from watching her. She was going from the head to the feet. She was all over the place. I had to stop her finally because I was getting dizzy. Um, and, and I had done a physical before that, so she saw me do it and she saw how I did and I know she was nervous. Um, but so we had to have a discussion about starting at the head. Um, so when you do that, you want to inspect it and you want to palpate at the same time. And make sure that you really you get in there and you touch their head. You want to look at their, their, uh, their um, hair. Is it thick? Is it thinning? The distribution? on the texture, you want to look at their scalp, you know, really get in there and look at their scalp and you want to look for any lesions, any scales, redness, um, scabbed areas, lumps, anything like that. And you want to note any deformities. Um, about two months ago, I had a man who came in for a physical, he was a brand new patient, and, and I was checking his head and where his fontanelles met at, at the top of his head was all, was this big, huge depression into his head. And um, and I w you wouldn't have noticed because he had a head full of hair. And, you know, I said to him, when did that happen? He said, I've had that since for my whole life. 
So obviously when the fentanyl is closed, something was pressing in there to get it to sink in like that. But um, you have to really get in there and look. So I have that marked on, you know, just in case somebody else should see him someday and they're looking at his head. So they'll know that that's not a new finding. So you, then you want to go, um, that's the scalp in the head. Um, then you want to go to the face. And you're looking for symmetry in the face. So when you check your cranial nerves, and I just put down here, this is how I always learned the cranial nerves on old Olympus towering top. A Finn and German viewed some hops. That's how I learned that 35 years ago, and I still remember it. And then the one underneath it is um, how I learned whether it was sensory motor or both. Um, so when you do the cranial nerves and you have them smile and you have them puff out their cheeks and you have them frown, you're looking for symmetry on both sides of um, face. And then you're going to test the muscle strength of the neck and, neck and shoulders. Okay. Okay. Okay, you want to assess their, their ability to discern sharp from dull sensations. You want them to close their eyes and you want to use something soft. And you say to them, is that soft or sharp? And then you ask them where they feel it, you know, in their forehead. If they say their cheek, you say which cheek, the left or the right cheek, because you want to make sure that they can figure out where that is on their face. And again, observing for symmetry. Inspecting, inspecting the neck for symmetry, scars, any pulsations or swelling. Um, especially if somebody comes in telling you, you know, that they're fatigued and they're having, you know, and you're thinking maybe there's a thyroid issue. You want to really look at that thyroid to see if it's, you know, if he has a goiter, if one side is really swollen. Um, or not. The position of the trachea, palpating the lymph nodes, which we'll get into in identifying and palpating the, the thyroid gland. And if they don't have any history of neck or spine trauma, you really want to check the movement of the neck. Can they flex their head and put their chin on their chest? Can they put it, uh, move it back, you know, to their back and they turn it side to side? And then can they bend it from the ear to the shoulder to the other side? And you're looking for any limitation in any in movement and any tenderness. And then you would note that and, you know, discuss that with them if they've had any issues or if that's new. This is just two pictures on where the lymph nodes are so that, um, and where you would palpate for them. And the best results when examining lymph nodes of the head and neck is to ask them just to um, relax their muscles and just bend their head just a little forward. And... Um, you want to systematically palpate the lymph nodes with the pads of your fingers um, to gently, and you want to gently move them um, over the tissue. I always start in the front of the ear and go up and around to the back, and then I go back to the back of the head, and um, then I do my posterior and um, anterior cervical ones, and then I go underneath their chin and then to their um, to the clavicles. I mean, you're going to find the way that works best for you, but you want to go really gently and slow, and you want to really palpate for them. Okay, and if you palpate one and you notice that it is a little enlarged, that you can really feel it, you want to note its size, its consistency. Um, is it hard or soft? Does it move? Um, is it tender? And where it's located? And then you want to look at the adjacent areas that it might be that it feeds to see if there's any inflammation in, around there, if you notice any infection or anything. I ask them to swallow when I get to the thyroid. And when I do the thyroid, yes, I always ask them to swallow. Um, a couple of times, so I usually give them a glass of water because the first swallow they can do, the second swallow they can never do. These are the different lymph nodes, um, and it tells you what they affect. So if you had a, an enlarged preauricular one, you'd look at their eye for ear infections. On um, the parotid gland, you would look for anything there if it's swollen. So these are the different ones that they're it's a good thing to know where they feed so that when you go to feel them and palpate them, you'll know what, what part of the area that would be affected by them if they should be enlarged. And here's the other ones. The next thing that we usually look at are the sinuses, um, which are are usually empty, except for maybe a thin layer of mucus, so they really shouldn't have fluid in them. They're connected system of hollow cavities in the skull. They, you have your frontal sinuses and your frontal, um, and your frontal lobe. You have your ethmoid between your eyes of the bridge. 
nasal bridge, and then you have your maxillary underneath um, your cheekbones, that's your cheekbones, which are the largest, and then your sphenoid sinuses. You have, when you look in the nose, which we'll get in a little further, um, you see the turbinates, and you look for swelling and erythema. You look at the septum to see if it makes sure that, um, to see if it's deviated at all, um, and then you'll notice that they drain, when they do drain, they drain into the nasal cavity. So when they do accumulate with fluid, um, it causes sensation of pressure, pain, and fullness. I don't know if anybody's had a sinus infection ever. I had one once, and it was just awful. Um, so to assess fluid um, for accumulation, they do what's called transillumination. Has anybody ever done it? No? OK. Um, I don't have a transilluminator in the office. I use the the nasal spec the nasal um light the enough I lost it. The autoscope I use that. Um and it works fine. Um so what you would do is you, you this shows you checking the maxillary sinus and um we'll get into what that means when you do see it, but that's how you check it and then you have them open their mouth and then you look in. It it's not that easy to see so you have to really look. And this is somebody checking the frontal sinuses. Who's that? Tyrone? Hey, quick question on that on that transillumination. Would would you actually be able to see the light through the cheek or no? If it has fluid. No, when you do it, it'll shine. The light will shine there on the cheek because you can't see it. But when you open their mouth, is what you're looking for to see if it's coming through. Because if there's fluid in there, it'll be dull. Whereas if there's no fluid, it'll be brighter, the light inside the mouth. So that's what you're looking for. Cause, and then if it's dull like that, usually a sinusitis is usually on one side of the face. It's not generally on both sides, both sinuses. It's usually one. So you're looking for dullness. So when you do this, you would do both sides to see if one is duller than the other. Um, and usually that will lead you to think that you have a sinusitis there. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And then you, you palpate, and you're going to palpate for tenderness, um, and you really want to press firmly over the sinuses and ask them if it hurts. Um, and if it does, does it hurt on both sides, or is one side does one side more tender than the other? And again, unilateral ten tenderness usually correlates with sinusitis on that side. And then you would go down to the maxillary sinus, and um, you check the maxillaries. And actually, you also check um, right below the maxillary too, around the, the gum line of your upper jaw, because a lot of times, if there's a maxillary sinusitis, you'll have dental pain there, and just pressing on that will cause a lot of pain, will cause discomfort, I should say, not pain. When they're trying to cause them any pain. Percussion is again, um, then you're going to percuss your sinuses, you strike them. Um, and that would again, when there's a sinus infection there, it'll cause some discomfort. Normally it won't cause any discomfort. Um, so that's what you'd find out um, when you do that one. So I have a case here. A 25-year-old male presents to an office for an urgent visit. He complains that about five days ago, he started with a headache on the right side of his head and a runny nose. The last two days, he's had nasal stuffiness, some right ear discomfort, some facial pressure, and, um, and he still has his headache. And when he bends over, he gets a really increase um, in the headache. So to investigate symptoms further, what other questions would you ask this person? Any fever, yes. Anything else? Dizziness. Dizziness, okay. What makes it better and what makes it worse? That's good. Nasal Does anything discharge. make it better or worse? Yep, very good. Change in vision. Okay. Why would his vision be changed? 
Oh, because of the headache. All right. Yes. All right. What else? Okay. Yeah, you could do the, the old cart, so. Allergies, exactly, allergies. You could ask him, um, does he smoke, is another question. Um, is he around other chemicals? Does anybody at work or anybody at home has it? If, is he drain, when he was draining, when his nose, um, when he was draining from his nose, what, was it clear? Um, was there a color? What was the consistency? How about loss of smell? Uh, when it started, well, he said about five days ago that he started with it. Um, has he ever had this in the past? You know, if he does have a history of allergies, did this, has this occurred? So how would you focus your assessment? Yes, yep, you're going to do AT&T and chest. What else? Vitals. But what specifically are you going to do? If he comes in, are you going to have him do, you're going to check all his cranial nerves and check his scalp and everything? Palpation? Yes. Percussion, palpation, percussion of the sinuses. You're going to look in his nose, right? Because you want to look into his nose. Um, and you want to look at the tissue in there. You want to see, is it red? Is it pale? Are the turbinates really swollen? Uh, you know, here it says here that his uh, nasal mucosa is very red and that the turbinates are swollen. However, the right side is more swollen than the left. Okay, so that would go in line also with um, maybe a sinus infection. Okay, yes, check his nasal canals. Check if he has post-nasal drip. Yes. You could ask him if he's, if he's had a cough at all. So what is your differential going to be? Rhino, somebody had sinusitis in Rhino. Yep. So say you said that he was, so say you had a, he had an acute sinusitis. Okay. Um, and that's usually diagnosed when the person has two or more symptoms of the presence of thick green or yellow nasal discharge. And then the next thing you're going to ask is um, yourself, is it viral or is it bacterial? And what's going to, what's going to lead you one way or the other? Well, he hasn't had it very long, right? The or, green? The color, the green? Well, it could be, but he's only had it five days. And mm -hmm. a lot, most times, sinusitis generally usually start as viral. You know, and then what happens is it either clears, or a lot of times, after like seven or eight days, it might start to get better, and then it gets worse again, and then you might start having the color. Um, but a lot of times, they start as viral. So you usually, you want to hold off giving him that antibiotic unless there's something that really tells you that it, it might be um, a bacterial one. Has he tried using antihistamines? That's a good question to ask him if he's, been, if he's used any. Um, so back to the differential. We have sinusitis, viral versus bacterial, and um, allergic rhinitis. And the thing with it is sinusitis usually goes hand in hand with rhinitis. Um, usually rhinitis will usually precipitate well, start it off, and then they'll end up with sinusitis. So you, if you do treat him with an antibiotic um, after 10 days to two weeks, yes. If you do treat him with an antibiotic, um, eventually you really need to treat him for his allergic rhinitis too, so with a nasal spray if he hasn't used any. Sometimes you just do the nasal spray, um, and sometimes that's enough to de shrink the turbinates so that it unblocks things and, and starts draining better. So, you know, it's again, it's how the patient's presenting and what you're seeing. Flonase, yep, Flonase, Nasacort. You know, if it's a pregnant woman, you use Rhinocort, because Rhinocort is um, a Category B, so you can use that. However, insurances don't like to pay for it. But um, so that's the other thing you have to look at, too, if somebody, I mean, obviously this is a male, so we don't have to worry about it.
but you have to look at if somebody's pregnant as to what else what you're going to um, give them for a medication. Clonase is the most common that's used. Yes, if he had a fever, if he had had a fever, um, then you might tend towards to um, the bacterial. However, it's only been five days. Usually, you want to wait at least um, seven to ten days before you before um, to see if it's going to continue before you start an antibiotic. And just so that you know, um, um, azithromycin is the one that a lot of people use as ZPAC, um, and they're finding that a lot of sinusitis are not responding to ZPAC, ZPAC because it's been overused. So they're recommending going back to the amoxicillin. Um, and again, it's where you work, but just so that you know, um, that's one of the recommendations that I've seen that people are having issues with that. Saline viral. Yes, I've had people use normal saline rather than the Flonase. Um, and that helps somewhat, um, but it doesn't always, sometimes it's just not enough. Um, sometimes I'll give them the Flonase and then have them use the nasal saline during the day, and that's helped too. Neti pots, yes, if somebody has a lot, is having a lot of infections, um, I've started them on neti pots. Um, they work really well. You just have to make sure that they follow the instructions and they don't overdo it. Um, but they do um, work well for people who have a chronic sinusitis. That was good. Okay, eyes. So now you're going to expect, inspect eyes. You want to inspect the eyebrows and you're looking for scaling um, or any issues of any masses or scars or anything up there. You're going to look at the eyelids. You're going to look at the flare and the conjunctiva. You're going to ask them, ask how their vision is. You know, have they been having any issues, any blurriness, any problems? Um, you're going to check their upper, their eyelids for ptosis. And um, ptosis is, with an open eyelid margin, typically touch the top and bottom of edges of the iris. And an upper eyelid droop can indicate a cranial nerve breed deficit. Um, so you always want to check that. Look at their eyes. Check their visual acuity. You can use either the, little, the Snellen card or you can use the, um, the big poster that you have to see in 20 feet away from. I have a card. It's a lot easier than bringing them out into the hallway and having them do it. So I just use the card you see in, you know, 14 inches away, and you have them read it, and that works just as well. Yes, a good decongestion does can work um, for sinusitis, for a viral. So when you do that, you inspect, again, the kind of type of for clarity, for discharge, for inflammation, for paler. You assess the palabral conjunctiva, which is the portion that lines the inside of the eyelids. And you, so you, what you do is you would gently pull down on their lower lid and you would have them look up. Um, and you would look at that area there. And then you look at the bulbar conjunctiva, you, you pull up their upper eyelid and you have them look down and you look at the eye that way and the conjunctiva. Um, you want to look at their, their lacrimal apparatus, and you want to look at their tear production, their eye lubrication, um, assess their sclera for clarity, for, for any yellow, um, jaundice-like, any hem um, hematomas, anything like that. I had a woman who was on um, Coumadin once and came in and had a, from sneezing, and she, all the blood vessels broke on the side of um, her right eye. Um, so you want to look at that. And if you see that, you want to ask them, are you on aspirin, are you on Coumadin, what's been going on, are you on Plavix? Um, you look at their cornea, their irises. You're going to check their pupils and accommodation. Um, you're going to check their um, extraocular eye movement. So you're going to check the six cardinal positions of gaze. Visual fields. I don't always test visual fields, um, but I do on occasion. Um, I used to, when I first started, I used to test, I tested everything under the sun. But I, I haven't, I only do that if I feel the need to. Um, you do the ophthalmoscope to look at the red reflex and the um, internal structures. And in under week number two, uh, there's some really good um, YouTube videos on using the ophthalmoscope and really looking at the eyes and the different structures. So you really want to look at those. So you want to explore any eye complaints. 
discharge, pain, vision changes, um, vision loss. So if you have somebody with an eye discharge, what kind of questions would you ask? Is it itchy? Yes. Is it painful? The color of the drainage, I'm assuming. Um, when did it start is a really good thing. Does it affect your vision? Yep. Um, how long is it crusty and uh, itchy? Yep. Does light bother it? Very good. Have you tried warm or moist heat? Yeah. What have you done um, to treat it if you've done anything? Does it itch? Are there tearing? How long has it been occurring? Injury? Yeah. Does anything reduce or increase the, um, the amount of discharge? Injury, did something happen? Um, does anybody else in the household have eye discharge or eye symptoms similar to this? Um, do you wear contact lenses is another good question. And then um, how often do you clean your contact lenses? Because contact... Um, because if they're dirty, they can cause issues like that, too. Um, yes, has there been any kids at school? If, they're, if it's a younger person, they go to school. Does anyone at home say? Um, do you have a fever, cough, runny nose, or, or allergies? So they're all, those are all questions. So when you do your focus assessment, you're going to examine the eye discharge because you're going to look at the color, the consistency, the amount. Is it, just, is it thin and yellow and watery? Is it purulent? You know, is it really crusty? What? What else are you going to look at? Too funny. I don't know what that means. But. Is it bilateral? Yep. Does it affect both eyes? Yep. You want to look at the conjunctiva to see if it's red um, and inflamed. You want to look at the lacrimal sacs for tenderness. You want to palpate around there. Um, and even see if you can disp disp uh, the express some of the discharge. Florentin testing, if injury, okay, I, that I wouldn't do. If there was an injury, I would send them to an eye doctor. Um, that I wouldn't do, but yes, if there was an injury, you would send there to see if there was a tear in there um, or an ulcer. Check the upper lid, lid swelling, yep. Ask them if they've taken any eye drops, yep. Again, with the contact lenses. Um, and you would ask, tell them, if they did wear contact lenses to, to go home, they needed to, I would have them get rid of that solution that they're using and get some brand new ones. And I tell them after, until the eye was totally clear, they had to leave all their contact lenses out, and I would tell them to go without makeup if it was a woman. So what's your differential going to be here for this? Conjunctivitis, okay. Bacterial or viral? Either. Conjunctive viral is usually clear or yellow discharge, whereas bacterial um, is usually a thick, sticky, purulent or mucopurulent discharge. And the con conjunctiva is usually inflamed, and the blood vessels there are usually dilated. So that's usually how you can somewhat tell. If there's an allergy, yes, exactly. It could be an allergic conjunctivitis, that's right. That is usually stringy, white, or scant discharge, um, just so that you know. Um, a corneal injury or infection that somebody had brought up before, um, so eye trauma. And again, if somebody has contact lenses, um, the, cor the um, solution can really cause an, an infection and an injury to the cornea if it's, if it's been contaminated. So that's the other thing, or improper cleaning. So that's the other thing to really stress with contacts. Love the slit lamp. Corneal abrasion. How often do you use that a lot? I've never used that. The slit lamp. How do you use that? Can you tell us? Lisa? Trash patient. It's, we use it often in the ER, need to die and look at the ice with the lamp. Okay. Yeah. And again, that's not something that I would do. I work in the primary care office. Um, so that's not something that I would do in the office. That's something, like I said, I would send to um, 
an eye doctor and have them do. But in the hospital and the ER, um, they can do it very easily there. Okay, ears. For ears, you're going to observe ear size and placement, assess the color, the integrity of the skin of the ears, and examine. You're going to really look at the external structures. You want to palpate the oracle. You want to check for freedom of movement, tenderness, any lesions, especially um, especially on middle age and up because of um, the sun that they had. A lot of times that's where you'll see a lot of um, your cancers um, and your actinic keratosis is on their on the top of their forehead, on the males that they're bald, and um, on their ears. Um, palpate behind the external ear, too, for lesions and tenderness, um, and your lymph nodes. And I've had a, a, quite a few people with um, lesions on their ears, and actually I've had two recently behind their ears of one lady 72 and the other one was 80-something that we happened to be palpating and um, at first, I thought it was from their glasses because it was right where their glasses were um, on their ears, but I sent them off, and they ended up being skin cancers, so they, they took care of them. But, yeah, you really want to check those areas really well. Um, using the otoscope to view the internal structures, you want to, you know, children and adults are different, so adults, you want to pour, um, pull the outer portion of the oracle up and back and slightly outward to really get in there to see um, your canal and your tympanic membrane. And you really want to inspect that tympanic membrane. Um, you want to look for your cone of light. You want to look for your bony processes. You want to look for any bulging. I saw a lady today, I checked her ears, and actually her right ear had a big, huge hole in her membrane. And um, she said that she's had that since she was a child. It's never changed. She can hear no different, and um, it doesn't bother her. But she has a good size hole in, in um, her membrane. And then you want to do the Weber test and the Rhine test. Um, and when you do the Weber test, you want to ask them, does it go, is, when you put it on there, do, do you hear it in both ears? If they do, do you hear it louder in one ear than the other ear? Um, the Rhine test, you do the air conduction versus bone conduction. Air conduction, you should hear longer than the bone conduction. Um, so they're really good. And then there's the whisper test that you can do, too. I do the whisper test sometimes. It depends on what's going on. But the Weber and Ryan, I always do um, at, at the complete physical. And then if things come in um, with hearing issues, if they're hearing, I mean, I hearing loss, I do it then, too, to check. So air complaints that you generally get, ear pain, ear discharge, hearing loss, and vertigo, okay? So if a patient comes in and complains of vertigo, which is an abnormal sensation of moving or spinning, um, how would you investigate that further? What other questions would you ask that person? How are you on the stairs? Okay. Or do you have any problems with stairs? Okay. Monitor their gait, okay. Their position, duration, okay. How long has it been going on, okay? Are you, you taking medication? Room? Are you taking any medication for it? Yep. How long have you had vertigo? Is it the first time it happened to you? Okay, any medication. Hearing loss, worse when looking down. Blood pressure assessment, fever. Past medical history, blood pressure. Um, how long do they last when you have it? Is it just... Does it last seconds or does it last a little longer? Um, how often do you get them? Does it happen every day? Does it happen five times a day? Does it happen once a month? How often do you get do you get it? Does the room spin or does your head spin? Yep. Have you fallen? Yep. Level of consciousness? All the time or certain time of the day? Yep. Are you are you into any medications? Did you have an upper respiratory infection recently? Any pain in the ear? Yep. Is it triggered by activity, trauma? Does anything decrease the sensation or make it stop, such as sitting or lying down? Um, lost consciousness, somebody already said that. Have you noticed any recent hearing loss, ringing in your ears or involuntary eye movements? 
Um, have you experienced recent nausea or vomiting? Okay. Have you taken anything for it? Would you perform? I have performed the Haldix test. I, I have done that. Um, I'm not sure I'm really good at it. I don't do it all the time, but I have done it. If I, if I think anybody, there's um, an issue a lot of times I send them to ENT. I had a lady who had come in. She was complaining of constant dizziness and vertigo. And um, her last doctor said that she had um, something wrong with her cervical spine and that was what was causing it, which I don't know. It didn't sound right to me because they had sent her for all this stuff and they did all this therapy and nothing ever changed. So I said to her, you know what, I'm going to send you to ENT because I said there's crystals in your middle ear, and if they get dislodged, um, they'll cause a dizziness like that. I said, so they can do the uh, um, vestibular table, the tilt table. And I sent her there, and they did the tilt table, and, I'll, and her dizziness is totally gone now. She has no issues with it. Um, but you have to look at other things just uh, when you do the ears. You have to look at the whole ear, you know, inside, especially the middle ear, because that will cause a lot of issues. But I do the, do the do do the Haldix test. I've done that a number of times. Like I said, I'm not sure I'm all that great at it because it's it's so rare that I do it. Cardiac issues is another thing. Yes, because you want to do an EKG, you want to listen to their heart, you want to see make sure that it's not coming from the cardiac issues aren't causing um, the vertigo or the dizziness. So that's yes, that's another thing. Dehydration is another one. Yes. Have you traveled recently, cruise flying? Or, yeah, all those things are really, those are really good answers and questions that you need to ask them. So well, I, so the assessment, what we're going to do, we can check orthostatics on them. Um, so you'd have them lying, sitting, and standing to see if there's a change, and you're looking for um, 20 millimeters of mercury or more in the systolic blood pressure to see if there's a change. Um, if they're taking any medications, you know, do they just get started on antihypertensives? A lot of times, if you if you move too fast when you first start on that, you'll get really dizzy too. And that's where a lot of this comes into when you ask them, you know, how many times does this episode occur, you know, in a week? You know, how long do they last? Because, you know, that will give you an idea too as to whether or not a medication could be causing it. Um, and you, like I said, their heart sounds, you can listen for any irregularities or murmurs, but you really want to get an EKG um, if you can. Uh, check for nystagmus is another thing that you want to do. So you want to check that. And um, does anybody know how to do that to check for nystagmus? I don't. Well, for to check to check for nystagmus, you're going to have the patient tilt their head backward and forward, or you can have them move it side to side. Okay, while sitting, and then you can watch for um, the rhythmic movements that way. Um, you can also have them lie flat and turn on one side and then the other side and see if that causes the issue too. Um, you just got to be prepared because sometimes it can cause nausea and vomiting. Be prepared there. Let's see, back and forth, lay down, Ted, yep, hold back, and then have them lay down, yes. Um, so what's your differential that you can have for this patient? Yep, CPTV. Yep, benign paroxysmal um, positional vertigo. And usually rolling from side to side is one way of testing that. And the symptoms usually come suddenly and last only seconds to minutes usually. Many years disease, yep, that's another one too. And that's usually chronic recurrent episode of vertigo accompanied by tinnitus pressure or fullness in the ears and nausea and vomiting. Um, and usually that can wax and wane too in severity. Um, what else is there? Tumor, yep. An acoustic neuroma is, um, could be one of the differentials. That's a benign tumor of the, um, causing repeated episodes of vertigo, imbalance, unsteady gait, tinnitus, and sensorial hearing loss. Um, and that tumor usually develops from the cranial nerve, um, from the eighth cranial nerve and grows into the auditory canal, causing the issues. 
And one more, acute labyrinthitis infection. Okay, yep. Earwax buildup, yeah. You're right. After P after we clean out people's ears, I've had some people, I'm telling you, it was like another person was living in there. Oh, my God, the things that I've gotten out of people's ears. And they do. They feel much better sometimes. They can hear better, and, and they feel better um, once it's out. And how do you treat earwax? What do you guys usually do? Investigating the cause of dizziness first, and then decide the course of treatment. Investigate the side effects. Yep. So what do you do for cleaning out earwax? What do you tell your patients? Flush. Yep. Coalesce in the air. Yep. That works pretty good, too. Half and half peroxide. I don't know if that. Coalesce in the ear. Sit for 50. Yep. And flush. Ear lavage. Saline warms. Yep. Okay. Do you guys, I have this machine. I don't, I have no idea what it's called, but um, you know, turn it on and it, it, moves back and forth, so it, it shoots water out. It works excellent because it does not work. Oh, the elephant ear machine. I don't know what that is. Um, but this machine works really good because it goes back and forth, so it, it hits the water, it hits the wax in a bunch of different ways, and it, it just lodges it, and chunks come out. It works really well. Air candles, uh, yeah, but I don't, you don't want to suggest air candles to patients. I tell them not to use Q-tips. However, they all use Q-tips. The elephant ear machine works great unless patient charge have used both. I don't know what the elephant ear machine is unless that's, that could be the machine that I have. I never heard it called that, though. All right. Okay, on to the nose. So for the nose, you're going to inspect, again, symmetry, deformity, lesions, and or inflammation. That's all the same thing. When you go from head down to neck, that's exactly what you're doing. Actually, when you check out the whole body, you're always looking for symmetry and deformity on both sides. Um, using the otoscope, you want to look into the um, mucosa. You're looking for paler. Are you looking for erythema, swelling, drainage, um, ulcerations, especially if somebody has um, you know, dry mucous membranes and stuff, a lot of times. They'll get a, like a little ulcer in there. Um, inspect for bleeding, perforation, deviation, and nasal septum. Um, and nasal drainage. You want to document color, amount, and consistency that they have. Mouth and throat. You're going to inspect the lips for color, moisture, and lesions. And you really want to look at the lips for lesions. I found a couple that were tiny, tiny, tiny um, that I ended up sending them to dermatology, and they ended up being little cancers. So you really want to inspect them well. Expect, uh, they examine the oral mucosa. If somebody has dentures and they'll do it, have them take them out so you can actually really look at their gums. So you can look at underneath that to see, uh, make sure that they're okay. Inspect the color, shape of the hard palate. Observe patient's tongue for symmetry, position, deviation, size, color, and texture. Um, tongue can tell you a lot of different things. Inspect the underside of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. You're going to look for no, any... Um, nodes, ulcerations, white or red spots. Um, note whether tonsils are there, um, if they're missing, if, are they enlarged, um, are they present and they're really red and they have exudate on them. You want to look at all that. And palpate the parotid gland um, externally. And you always want to look inside their mouth and identify the opening to the parotid gland, um, which should align laterally to the second molar. And you want to assess for inflammation, lesions, and stones. I had a run... On, on stones in the parietal gland of about six months ago. I had like three women and on the same day, all with right left side of their parietal gland, all swollen. And um, you could feel the stones in there. So you really want to check that area good. Oh, thank you. You'll post those pictures. Thank you. I'd like to see them. So has anybody else had patients with um, parietal gland stones? No? Okay. Well, if you do, they get really swollen. One of the things that you have them do is you have them suck on lemon drops because by sucking on them, it'll help draw it out a little. Um, you do little heat with, you know, massage and then you do an antibiotic. Um, so, but that's how you treat, and they're very, it's very painful. It's very painful. But like I said, I had those three women. It was on the left side. I'm not sure why. 
and you could when you palpated you could feel like a little stone in there i couldn't get it out when i was there but you know like i said if you have them stuck on um they're stones just like your body makes stones i don't think i didn't end up sending them because they never came out they never came back after that it it resolved the between the lemon drops and the antibiotics and everything it typed it out so i don't even know if they found it when it came out so i never got to send them otherwise i would have sent them to be tested Okay, so you have a 32-year-old female in the office for an urgent visit. She's complaining of a sore throat, having difficulty swallowing her own saliva, fever, headache, and, inf and fatigue. So, again, what are the types of questions you're going to ask her to investigate this further? Onset, yep. How long? Yep. Family members that have it? Yep. How do you treat fish or tongue with edema and pain? I don't know. I've never had anybody with that. Um, how long you had the sore throat? Kathleen might be able to answer the question. How long have you had the sore throat? Cough. Have you had a history of this before? Onset. Check the tonsils. Yep. I've never heard of a fish or tongue. Yeah, I've never had anything like that. Um, any upper respiratory infections, cough, runny nose, watery eyes, ear pain, change in hearing, do you still have your tonsils? Um, have you had this in the past? And when did it start? So when you do your focal assessment, you're going to look in their ears, you're going to look in their nose, you can palpate their sinuses, um, and you're going to look in their throat. You might want to check a rapid strep on them. Very good. Rapid strep screen. Yep. Difficulty swallowing. Yeah. And that says that if they're just having difficulty. Um, look for peritonsal abscesses as long as it's not excessive drooling. Yep. Anything that they relieve the symptoms. Have they tried anything? Yes. I like the ones that come in and say, I took my father's antibiotic that he got three years ago, but it didn't help. Like, okay. So what are your differentials? And you might even want to do a culture because... I've had quite a few people that have come back that it looked just like strep, and when I did the rapid strep, it was negative, so I sent them out for culture. Um, so, yeah, acute tonsillitis. Yep. Um, strep throat. Viral pharyngitis is another one. Yep, allergies and upper respiratory infection. Important thing to remember is strep throat is most common between the ages of 5 and 15. Um, it can affect people of all ages. However, as people grow older, the the risk, uh, the likelihood of strep goes down. And I had a lec I went to a lecture, um, Ted Fitzgerald. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard her lectures, but, and that's what she was saying. It's very rare for a 70 or 80 year old to have strep throat. And it was funny because that week I had two 95 year olds both who trusted positive for strep. So I wanted to write a letter and say, I don't think that's true anymore. But anyways, according to her, as, as you go up in age, the risk of strep goes down. Um, okay. And to remember that tonsillitis doesn't always necessarily mean strep throat because you can have tonsillitis from a different bacteria, okay, than strep. Bad breath, okay, yes, that's one of them. Mono is another one, too, that you would you could check for. Um, and then viral versus bacterial pharyngitis and, you know, the tonsils. Bronchitis? Um, you could, you, 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 well, you would definitely listen to their lungs. So you would see if they have a history of asthma and the issues, and that would be a question that you could ask her. But usually if you look in the throat, and you can see that extra date and stuff, and the tonsils are swollen. Usually, if you do a rapid strep, um, you could go from there. What about mono? Yes, mono is another one that you could um, check for. Um, post nasal drip. Yep. A negative rapid strep doesn't necessarily mean negative until culture set up to check for false negative. We had a, yeah, so didn't we? we? I've had a couple that I could have swore 
that it was strep and they came back negative, so I cultured them and sent them off, and they actually ended up coming back positive. Uh, fissured tongue is found in Wilkinson Rosenthal syndrome, only treated if debris is in the tongue, usually with a geographic tongue, usually autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. I found info on Medscape. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, treat them anyway. Yes. Yeah, usually I treat them, especially if they um, – the quacking duck theory. <laughs> okay. I treat them only because I know it's like to have strep throat, and I know it's like not to be treated and having to wait for that culture, and it's awful. Um, so – and my daughter got very sick because she, they wouldn't treat her because she tested negative for her rapid shrub, and she ended up getting very sick. Um, so that's the only reason I treat usually if it if it really looks like strep to me because, um, like I said, sometimes the rapid shrub doesn't come out positive. Oscultate. Oh, no. No, we're going to go. That got stuck in the wrong place. Sorry. We're going to palpate the thyroid gland. Now, um, that's right. You can call and have them stuff the antibiotic if the culture comes back negative. Um, that's right. You worked with someone who, who didn't get who got rheumatic fever. Yeah, that's right. You have to really be careful um, with strep throat. My daughter ended up with. Um, a mitral valve prolapse after it. They said, you know, nobody seems to think it, it was the same thing. It came from it, but it came, she didn't have that prior to that strep throat, and she was really sick with it. Um, she, she was a mess. So, um, so I've always, if it looks like it, I just treat it, and yes, you can call them and, and tell them not to take it if it comes back negative. Um, yes, it probably is part of the reason, but you know what? You can get an awful lot of issues, especially with strep throat, if it's not treated. If it's not treated, so I do it. You you do what you want. Actually, you know, it's your nursing practice. When you get out, so you do what you want. I've just found that they come back negative, and then they come back positive in the culture. And I've waited three or four days till that culture came back, and you know, they've lost weight. They're not eating. They're not drinking, and they're really sick. So I would just rather do that. So palpating the thyroid gland. You want to inspect the thyroid gland first. You're looking to see if there's any enlargements there, um, any swelling. When you palpate it, you, you're looking for any tenderness. Um, you can do the posterior approach where you stand behind the patient. Um, you're going to have them lower their chin to relax their muscles, and you locate the thyroid. You, you want to find the isthmus, which is in the middle there. Um, placing the thumbs against the back of the neck and resting the tips of your forefingers over the lower half of the trachea. Um, and you're going to have them swallow, and you're going to feel the isthmus, and you have them swallow, and then you feel have them, you feel each lobe, and you would have them swallow again. That's why it's good just to give them a little glass of water. It's easier for them to swallow. Um, and you're looking to see if it's get if they're both lifting up, um, if one's getting stuck, and it's not. So you really want to check it. And then there's the anterior approach, which I usually use. I've done both, but for some reason I just like the anterior approach better, where I stand in front, and you hold in front of. Um, the cricoid around there, and then I just have them tilt their head forward. And if I'm feeling on the left side, I have them tilt to the right side. If I feel on the left side, I have them tilt over to the um, the other side so that I can check it. Um, and then I have them swallow again. And then you're gonna you auscultate. You can, you auscultate, and I'm gonna start from the bottom, the thyroid, and you're checking for any breweries, and you want to listen over the lobes themselves. And you want to even ask the person to hold their breath while you're listening so you can actually hear. And it's not the breathing that you're hearing. And if there is a brewery to the thyroid, it represents um, increased blood flow, which is usually found in a hyperthyroidism with the hyperplasia of the gland. And you want to list at the isthmus and at each of the lobes. I guess they can still continue. Okay. So you, you find it hard to... Um, Feel the thyroid. You should be able, if you put your hand, if you stand in front of them, and you can do it on yourself too, and that's how I practice actually. Um, and you put it right around in between 
where your sternocleidomastoid muscle is right around where the cricoid is, and you hold in there and you swallow, you can feel it go up and down. Even if it's a small one, you should be able to do that. If it's a really person with a really thick neck, sometimes it's harder. But if you put it in there and you have them bend their head down and to the side, you can feel for any nodules. And when you swallow, you should be able to feel it go up and down. Um, okay. That's end. Carotid arteries, um, you're going to listen for the breweries. Again, you're going to have them hold their breath so that you can hear it a little better. You're going to palpate. You always want to palpate one side first and then the other side, and it's just gently. Um, you don't have to really push in there. You just want to palpate gently. And then the temporal arteries, you want to listen up there too. Um, place the bell over the temporal artery, um, just lateral to the outer um, canthus of the eye, and you want to listen for any um, breweries up there too. Okay, so we have a 34-year-old female presents to an office with an urgent visit. She's complaining of feeling tired. She has a weight gain of 10 pounds in one month. She has a depressed mood, kind of a flat affect. And she states, you know, I just can't seem to get warm. So what are the questions that are going to ask her? What other symptoms that would be, would you think of that she might have that goes along with this? Hair loss, yes. And hair loss, when you listen, when you look for hair loss, if, you, if somebody comes in and complains of, uh, you know, they have a patch of hair that they lost, um, what you want to look at is um, when it grows back, are the hairs all the same length or are they at all different lengths? Because, you know, that has a lot to do with why, what might be the cause. So you want to look at that. You also want to look at, you know, do they pull their hair back real tight and put it up in a bun so there's always pull on it. You can do the hair pulling test to see if hair actually pulls out. So um, let's see, difficulty breathing. Let me get back here because you're going so fast. Uh, let's, let's see. Oh, let me get it. Where are we? Sorry, I'm just trying to find the comments. Let me get past to where we are. Okay, history of thyroid problems. Does she have a thyroid problem? Does she have dry skin? Take long nap. History of thyroid. TSH is important to check. Yes, it is. You can check T3 and T4. I know around here, we do a thyroid cascade. If the TSH is normal, they don't do the rest of it. They don't do a T3 and T4. If the thyroid is abnormal, then they, if the TSH, I mean, is abnormal, then they do it. Family history is a big one. A depression screen. Yes, you would do a depression screen because you don't know, um, what else might you so you would check on that trouble swallowing or feeling something in their throat yes exactly check the meds that they're on yep you want to ask them about their menses because if somebody's hypothyroid their menses will be very 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 heavy so you could ask them if there's been a change um constipation is a big thing too with hypothyroidism yes any other autoimmune disease that's true so those are the other things that you would look at weight yep so she had gained 10 pounds in one month. You could ask her over the past year, has she put on any weight too? Or when did she notice, other than last month, has she noticed anything prior to that? You also want to check her nails. Hypothyroidism, their nails tend to be very brittle. Um, okay, and again, you're going to look for a goiter to see if there is one. Um, and then you're going to palpate the goiter. Um, vitiligo, yes, vitiligo is one too. Um, one of the autoimmune diseases that you see with that. Um, palpate their thyroid, listen over their thyroid. Um, if their TSH is positive, you're going to check their, for antibodies. Um, if it's really enlarged um, and you can feel those, sometimes I do an ultrasound. Um, sometimes it's not Hashimoto's. It could be Hashimoto's. Sometimes it's just a thyroiditis. And you'll notice when somebody has a thyroiditis, it's usually not the whole thyroid that's swollen. It's not the whole thyroid that's tender either. It'll usually be one lobe or the other, and um, a lot of times they'll have pain that goes to their ear. It's, it's not actually in their ear. If you ask them where their pain is, they'll show you. They'll point from their thyroid, and they'll go up their neck to their ear, and it'll it, not necessarily a pain inside their ear, but that hurts their pain, and I've noticed that's been a common thing. And then a lot of times their TSH and their um, antibodies will be sky high, and then you treat it. And, and it goes down, and, and they're fine. It'll resolve itself. 
Also, so you're going to check for depression. You're going to check for um, their thyroid. You also want to check for anemia because anemia can make you feel really tired. It can give you a real depressed mood. It can make you feel cold. Now it won't make you give the gain the 10 pounds, but if you're kind of depressed and you're not moving around, you might gain the 10 pounds. So, you know, that's the other thing to ask them. What's your diet like and what's your exercise been like too? Or have you just been sleeping a lot? You've been more of a couch potato than you haven't been moving around. So you have to really investigate what else is going on there um, besides just it being their thyroid. Um, 